It's Monday morning, the start of another week at Red Bank Middle School. Teacher Janelle Melton has something special planned for her fifth graders. The students take their seats, but Janelle doesn't show up. School had been in session for a couple of weeks, and President Obama had did a speech about education. She was going to bring her class to my class, and we were going to play the speech inside the classroom. Janelle taught social studies, had a passion for history, and also knew how to teach it to students to get them interested in it. And her enthusiasm about history, it transferred to the students. They loved it. I knew Janelle in Trenton when we were young. Her elementary school was across the street from my house. And I used to talk little junk to her and, you know, flirt with her a little bit, things of that nature. Once I graduated from college and I started working as a, a counselor for school based youth service, and she was also a teacher, and I saw her. I was like, wow, she's looking good. She was the one. And I felt like I should put a ring on her hand. Me and Janelle got married in Jamaica August 28th, uh, 2003. I was excited and stuff, like I'm really married. A happy home life and rewarding careers. It appears Janelle and Michael have a solid foundation. But three years after their wedding, that foundation starts to crack. She cared about me tremendously. It was just like, I had never met nobody that was so into me like that. Whatever I needed, she was right there. But the way I was raised later on, it kind of made me feel uncomfortable because I wasn't used to that much affection. That's why I filed for divorce. Most of the people probably thought that she wanted to divorce me, but she wouldn't have never left me. She told me that. So we still saw each other all the time, and we talked on the phone every day. F the school day slips away, and there's still no sign of Janelle. The school secretary asks Michael to check on the missing teacher at her home in Neptune City, about 20 minutes away. I pull up at the house, and I see the car in front of the house. So I feel kind of relieved, because I know she is at least home. So I'm thinking I'm just going to bang on this door, yell out her name, tell her to get up, and tell her to go to work. I yelled out her name. It was no answer. And then I tried the doorknob, and the door was open. And I went in. And I was still yelling out her name, yelling out her name. And I made the quick left to go to the room. And then when I walked in the room, that's when I saw her on the floor. When I found her, she had her nightgown on. And I saw a little bit of blood at the top of the nightgown. And her face looked like it had makeup on it. So I immediately thought that she fell when she was doing her makeup. And then that's when I picked up the phone and I called 911. And I told them to um, hurry up and come over. When they came, the first person went up to her, and he was like, miss, 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 ma'am, ma'am. He felt her neck, and then that's when he told me she was dead. I talked to the secretary, and I'm like crying hysterically and stuff. Then I told him, like, the guy says she's dead. It was evident to the detectives involved that Jonelle Melton was the victim of a brutal, beating, and she was tortured. Because of the how physical the crime scene was, how brutal it was, we believed it was a male more than one. The kitchen dinette area had a window, which I noticed immediately as a point of forced entry. Directly under that window, on one of the chairs, was a footwear impression where someone came through the window and stepped on that chair. Throughout the house, we noticed that there were no candles. We know that the victim was not a smoker. There were no cigarettes. There were no ashtrays. But at the base of that window, we located a pink-colored lighter. And the lighter itself seemed to be out of place. At first, the detectives started out like they was trying to get information and ask me about our relationship. And then when I started answering the questions and telling them, then they started getting a little, like, a little invasive. Even if they was trying to come off of me like crazy and stuff, I just still was answering their questions because I knew I didn't do nothing. There was no reason for Michael to ever be involved in anything like this. He, he still had a wonderful relationship with Janelle. Although they were ex-spouses, 
they didn't act like ex-spouses. They had a really nice personal and working relationship. Investigators might have moved on from Michael, but the media hasn't. Now, all of this time, I'm thinking that I'm being truthful and helping them, like telling them everything they needed to know. And then two days later, when a newspaper article came out, that's when I knew that something was wrong. It said she was found. It didn't say who found her. And in the last paragraph, it said she was estranged from her husband. And when I saw the word estranged, I said, whoa. Then it said that divorce was supposed to be final October 6th. And this was like September 16th. So now I'm like, oh my god. They trying to say I killed her. Forensic tests on the crime evidence are murky. There's no clear cut answer on the boot print and Tex can't lift a usable fingerprint from the latex gloves. In the case of the cigarette lighter, dna able evidence was recovered, but they were unable to identify who the major contributor was on that item. As a result, I requested that we transport that evidence to the New York City Medical Examiner's Office for additional DNA analysis. Janelle's family braces for the third holiday season without her. Finally, though, there's a break. Techs find DNA on the lighter. They were able to identify the major contributor to the DNA as Gregory Jean Baptiste. We're trying to say that your DNA is obscene. Jean Baptiste denies everything, and there are no witnesses. The case of the teacher who never showed up for class goes as cold as the ice in the Red Bank Armory. Tired of being cloaked in suspicion, Michael can't wait for police any longer. He reaches out to a friend to help him clear his name. If something happened in Brighton Norms right there, the streets talk. I knew I couldn't go out there and get information from anybody because I'm not from there. So I knew he could. He called this guy over, and he told the guy, like, yo, this is my man's. He just want to know what happened to his wife. It's driving him crazy. We came back two days later, and the guy told me what happened. So information had come off the street that individuals, gang members, were looking to rob a drug dealer named David Munch, an individual who lived directly next to Janelle. He said that the guy that lived next door to her had $15,000 in a freezer and some drugs in the house. And the girlfriend was running her mouth at a party, and some stick-up kids heard her at the party. So they came to rob their house, and then they went to the wrong house. And then I guess they assumed that Janelle was the girlfriend. The information coming into me was that these individuals, Ebenezer Bird, Gregory Jean Baptiste, and Jerry Spraulding, with a female, committed this horrific homicide. Detective Scott Samus and Matthew Quagliato want to question Narika Scott, the girlfriend of Ebenezer Bird. The video speaks for itself. The video shows her cooperation, how scared she is. Narika said that when she was at a prison visit with Ebenezer Bird, he had confessed to her that him, Gregory Jean Baptiste, Jerry Spaulding, were involved in the murder of Janelle Melton. So he says it's him and Jerry Sprawling, and he's with a girl. Do you know the girl if I showed you a Elizabeth picture? Elizabeth Pinto. Elizabeth Pinto was a former girlfriend of Ebenezer Bird, and she turned out to be the key witness in this case. Hey, hold on up. Okay. You all right? Matt and I bring her to one of the Perth Amboy Police Departments, and we go live. And probably the most important interview of my life. So tell me about in September, early September, what, what happens? You could see there's a little bit of fear in her eyes. Um, she is very trembly in her voice. She, she's very standoffish. She really doesn't want to talk about it. They all get dressed up in black, as they, you know, done before. And they tell me to drop them off. I drop them off at a location. Let me, let's slow it down a little bit. I, I go over with uh, pictures of these guys. Who's this? That's Ebenezer Bird. Who's this? Gregory Jean Baptiste. Who's this? Jerry Sprawling, you know? And you continue to have her ID these guys. Where did they tell you where they were going? 
Uh, they just told me to drive. They told me where to go. Gregory Jean Baptiste, Jerry Spaulding, and Ebenezer Bird are charged with first degree felony murder, second degree robbery, conspiracy, and unlawful weapons charges. All three men maintain that they are innocent and are not responsible for the murder of Janelle Melton. She was a, a valued member of the community, and no one deserves for this to happen to them. But of all people, it's the fact that it happened to Janelle, it's, 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 even, it's even worse. When this happened, it was like it reignited me, like, you know, like I, my hope. Like, wow, you mean she could get justice? Throughout the trial, there's contentious motions going on between the defense and the state. They tried to make it look like Mike Melton did it, and uh, that clearly didn't happen based on the evidence. Police tested so many different items of evidence and went through so much forensic testing, and yet still the defense is, well, what about this? They didn't test this, or they didn't do that. They, they could have done this. What if, you know, that type of thing. So we had to counteract that. DNA found on the lighter puts Gregory Jean Baptiste at the scene. Phone records place all three men at Janelle's apartment complex on the night of the murder. Ebenezer Bird, Gregory Jean Baptiste, and Jerry Spalding are all found guilty of first degree murder, robbery, conspiracy, and weapons charges. Once I heard the first guilty, I just knew that it was going to be guilty, 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 guilty. And then it was just like, yes. I remember doing that fist bump thing like, real happy, like, yes, like, it's over. When I heard it, I was at school. I couldn't contain myself. I ran into the principal's office, who had a relationship with Janelle and loved her, and I told her, and we just started hugging and crying. We just started hugging and crying. Gregory Jean Baptiste, Ebenezer Bird, and Jerry Spaulding are all sentenced to life in prison. Despite their convictions, all three men still claim to be innocent. In exchange for her cooperation, Elizabeth Pinto is allowed to plead guilty to conspiracy and is sentenced to probation. On that day, 2009, two people died. Not only she died, but I died too because I wasn't the same person after that. I miss her. I guess I'll always miss her. The pain and the anguish has diminished, but the missing her, that's still right there. It's right there. <laughs>